Um, what I cannot do, sadly, is give you individual financial advice. So I'm not a licensed financial planner. Um, and even if I was, there's a whole process that would have to be happening before I was able to give you any individual advice. So I can answer the questions in general. Um, but if you want to know where you should invest and which unit trust you should choose, those things are not going to be um, on the table for this evening. All right. So um, I'm going to, and just trying to assess the, the order in which we do things this evening, I'm going to start with the basic principles and sort of a build up. As I've taught this over the years, I've refined it um, and kind of come up with what I think is an accessible model for managing your finances. Um, in reality, we cannot spend all day every day managing our finances. God has put you on the earth to do something else. Pop. Um, so, you know, getting a handle on this aspect of your life is very important, but it shouldn't be so complicated that actually it's impossible to do. Or that it takes up so much of your time that you do nothing else. All right, so this sort of will start with the basic principles and then I'll move into some of the more uh, relevant just ideas around where we are at the moment with COVID-19 and um, you know, we'll chat about some of those issues. Okay. I'm not sure why my slide is not progressing. Oh, there we go. Okay. So this is sort of the basic model. Um, so at the heart of money management, shock and horror for Christians, um, is your heart. So we'll talk about this first. I'll go through each one of these um, individually. And at the center of this model is your heart. And then there'll be six elements around that. So your income, giving, spending, saving, investing, and protection. All right, so that's the basic agenda for the model that we'll be going through. I'm going to start with the heart. Okay, so finances really do work from the inside out. And um, it is very hard to um, hide where your heart is from sort of how you're conducting yourself in your finances. So where your heart is will come out in the money. Okay, so it's often sort of a, a warning sign if you're feeling tempted to buy things you can't afford or, um, you know, there's a lot of conflict in your family about how money is spent and who's spending it. Sometimes that is an early warning system, sometimes a bit of a late warning system maybe of something that is up in your heart. Um, often it's an identity thing, you know, if you're not feeling secure in the Lord or other things, you know, you're looking for that security in stuff. Um, and so, so often money is an outworking of what's in your heart. We know Matthew 6.33 says we seek his kingdom first and all these things will be given to us. So our goal really at our hearts is to keep him as number one and not seek all the other things. We seek him, we seek his righteousness. And that's really where our heart should be. And that is obviously, as you would know, if you're on that journey, is a daily exercise and a daily discipline. All right, and we place our confidence in God, not in our finances. So we've definitely seen with Andrew and I, when, you know, we, I'll talk a bit about it later, and if I forget, please remind me. You know, we have had times where Andrew was unexpectedly retrenched also known as constructive dismissal. Um, and it was an awful, uh, devastating thing for him from a personal perspective, but also for our finances, that's half our income gone. And, um, and yet in those times, financially, yes, it's very difficult, but we find it much easier in those times to really hold on to God from a money perspective and trust him. When we are okay, or we feel in our own selves that we are okay and we are managing with our income, we tend to sort of put finances you know, a confidence in ourselves as, as opposed to God. And it is, again, that constant discipline of, am I now relying on me? I'm not so stressed. I don't feel like I need massive amounts of faith in this area. And then I get lazy and I forget that actually it's all about him. My confidence is in him. And if tomorrow everything is gone, I am still his child. I'm still together. Okay. Um, just also from a financial point of view, um, it, this is not the center of our universe. For some of us, finances is your calling, it is your life, and what you do every day is in this area. And for a lot of us, it isn't. And so for us, um, God has given you a specific purpose on this earth, and finances to a degree are what sort of help you get that done. So it's ticking some boxes um, around, you know, living, and these are important boxes, your house, your food, whatever, but it's not the center of your life. 
It takes care of some things so that you're able to do what God has called you to do. So we don't put those things first. Um, you know, what it is we're meant to be doing takes priority and the finances God provides to us to facilitate us doing what he has called us to do. All right. And then I just love the scripture, wisdom from Proverbs. Proverbs 23, verse 4 to 5. So you can just get the sense of wearing yourself out to be rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. You know, we chase this riches. But at a glance, riches could just go. Um, they can surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. And you do need to hold on to these things quite lightly. Um, put these, the, put stuff in perspective. You know, it, it could be here today and tomorrow it literally can be gone. Um, and, and just, you know, your significance is not found in what car you drive or everything that you own or the clothes that you wear. Um, and, you know, if those things disappear, do you then become worthless? You know, because that's sort of the implication. If I'm so important because of my fancy car, if I lose my fancy car, do I then, you know, what does that say about my self-worth? All right. And we know that, you know, we are children of God, princes and princesses of the Most High God. We are his children. Um, and the things that we own are actually... You know, we might love some things. I mean, you know, in our car, we, had, we quite like cars. I'm a petrol head. I didn't know this, but recently I've discovered. Um, but, you know, it's not important to me. It just, just gives me some joy when I drive something fun. But, um, you know, if you ask me to give up my car tomorrow, I would. So it's kind of keeping those things in balance. And I believe that God, you know, he wants us to also enjoy things. Um, but that we don't find our, our significance in them, you know, if you can sort of get this distinction. All right. Um, and then staying with the heart, uh, it's, a, it's important. So the, just that heart of stewardship. So everything we have is God's and everything is God's and he is entrusted to us to steward what is his. his. So this, when you have this perspective, does change your perspective on needs versus wants. Um, you know, needs are things that we genuinely do need. We need food, we need schooling, we need clothing, we need housing, housing, we need protection, we need warmth, we need a lot of things. And then there are a whole lot of things that we really want. Um, and that stewardship is what helps us to balance those wants and keep them in perspective and manage how we spend money to access those wants. Um, so when we have this heart of stewardship, we can align our priorities with God's priorities and helps us to avoid excess. Um, I think sometimes we, you know, um, depending on our family backgrounds, if we've had a lot of lack in your past, it's quite hard to have, um, you know, that almost trust and peace that actually I'm a child of the Most High God, everything is His, and I have everything that I need mindset. Um, you know, and it's something that if we can rest in that space and find a way to get ourselves into that mindset, um, we're a lot more at peace. There's a lot less urgency around chasing after stuff. You know, I will have what I need because it's all the Lord's and he will give me what it is that I need when I need it. Um, so I'm going to talk about this, about this a bit later, but stewardship and cheap are not the same things. So sometimes we can be very proud of how little money we spend. Um, this is also not a godly attitude. Okay, remember pride's not encouraged in the Bible. Um, but, you know, there is this element of, uh, I might use car examples a little bit too much, apologies in advance, but um, Tenda Musa Kavani, um, he was a leader in our church a number of years ago and is in Boston now, um, he used the example, which I'll never forget, about having so this much pride in how little you spent on a car, um, but you actually put your family in this really unsafe tin box but you're so proud of how little you spent on the car but you're actually jeopardizing your family's safety you know so if you can and you know it's still well within your stewardship requirements to put your family in the safest car you can afford okay so kind of get that distinction between spending as little as possible is not also good stewardship all right there is this element of being responsible and stewarding what we have been given so stewardship is quite easy when you only have enough for what you need. So Andrew and I have never really had difficult conversations around stewardship and giving and money and, you know, where we can spend money when we've only just had enough. You know, then you are just grateful that at the end of the month, you've covered everything you need to pay. And then the more that the Lord gives you, the more requirement there is. 
for stewardship and the moral conversation that says, yes, I could buy this new TV because I would like to. The other one isn't totally dead, but you know, could I do something better with that money? And having those conversations and the more that the difference is between you know, your income that covers just your needs and the rest of your income, the more kind of disposable income you have, the greater the stewardship responsibility and the more those, um, you need to consider all of those elements. And then also in relation to your heart, it's just you. Uh, you are a whole, not entirely perfect person with a background and personality tendencies and all sorts of other things. So when we're looking at managing our finances, don't ignore, you know, the realities of you. Uh, so it's a good idea to have a look at all of these elements and see, you know, what am I bringing in here that is maybe affecting how I am managing my finances. That could be in a good way or in a not so good way. So just having a bit of a, a check on, you know, who am I, what am I doing here, um, and what are these influences that are maybe influencing my decisions that I haven't really thought about before because they're sort of just part of who I am. So some of them is we have our family backgrounds, you know, so for a lot of us, uh, we might be the first people in the family to have got degrees, to get, um, you know, sort of professional working jobs. And we haven't necessarily had a model uh, in our parents or the generations that have gone before of, you know, what is a bond? What happens with borrowing? What happens with, you know, managing complicated financial decisions? So, you know, we, we may not have had exposure to a lot of financial instruments or financial, you know, things. Um, so that may be something that we're excited to get to know that may cause us fear in that area. Um, you know, do, do you have a, a model in your life whose footsteps do you think you should be following in because they were really wise in this area? Or is there no one in your family who, um, who you can think of who actually they did this really well? And what are the things I can learn from that person? Maybe I want to do the complete opposite of what has been modeled to me. So just having a look and see. Um, expectations from our families. Um, we do not live in isolation. We live in a community. We live in, uh, you know, in a family. And some of our family backgrounds are difficult. And we have families who have needs. Um, and what are the expectations and the pressures on our finances brought to us by our families. I'm going to talk a little bit about that again just now. Um, and then again, just, you know, your frame of reference, as I said, what did you see? I mean, Andrew grew up in an environment where not a single person had a degree. You know, so it, it wasn't when it came to him leaving the trick and going to study, it wasn't like he knew there were 25 things available that you could study. You know, he knew about a doctor and he knew about a dentist, but really not a lot of, um, not a lot of exposure. Frame of reference, he lived in King Williamstown, you know, not a lot of money, not a lot of degrees, um, you know, so his frame of reference was, he went to university and his mind was a bit blown, but what was out there? Okay, and then just your personal tendencies. You might just naturally be a spender, you might naturally be a saver. So it's good to identify this, um, because obviously this will impact how you manage your finances. Um, you may just be terrified of this whole area. Okay, it's just too much, numbers are not my thing, I just, I'd like to hide if that's okay. Um, other things, I mean, this is just one silly example, um, but what do you do when you're stressed? Like, does that spill over into money? You know, are you a comfort shopper? Are you, um, you know, does, how do you manage when you are stressed? So, um, I see what's in the chat. Um, yeah, so, I mean, who are you and how does this manifest in your kind of spending habits and your tendencies and what triggers you? You know, some of us get triggered to eat when we stress, some of us shop. You know, all of those things are useful to identify and put things in place to sometimes protect ourselves from ourselves. Okay, and then your context. So if you are on this meeting, um, you are probably living in Johannesburg. And we know that Johannesburg is um, known for its materialism and its comparison. So if you live here, um, you sort of are under a bit of pressure to look a certain way, drive a certain car, and there's this element of materialism, almost a spirit over the city. So it's good to be aware of these contexts um, and to see how is this maybe impacting me? Am I getting myself in debt to impress someone I don't really care about at all? Um, to make myself look richer? Uh, you know, does that say something about how I feel about myself? You know, my sense of identity, my self-worth, all of these things. So as I said earlier, 
watch what's happening with your money, watch where you're spending, watch where you're tempted to spend, even if you're not doing it. It's giving you a sense of where your heart is and maybe some areas where, you know, possibly there is some work for you to do with the Lord. And a lot of it is often just identity. I don't feel whole and okay in myself. And I'm compensating for buying a whole lot of stuff. I'm hiding behind a whole lot of stuff. I'm trying to make myself look important with a whole lot of stuff. Okay, so these are good spaces to start with the finances. Okay, so that's the heart. Okay, then the next one is giving. And you notice I'm going to do giving before money, before income. All right, so if you have a look at the biblical model, giving comes before getting. So God gives seed to the sower. So often we go, when I have more money, I'll give more. So remember the story uh, about the very poor widow who just had enough food and oil and flour for one loaf for her and her six son in the times of the uh, famine and Elijah asked her to make that bread loaf for him and she did and she didn't have anything um, and she gave before she got anything and those are humbling examples for us because she had nothing and he asked her to give of the nothing that she had um, so it is always it's hard and this is where our faith is stretched and exercised and I mean it is a bit silly but I sometimes when I'm a bit stressed about our finances I give away money because I know it puts me in a place of faith. It puts me in a good space with the Lord and it just, um, it helps me clarify what's important. Um, then I move out of that. I'm going to hold on to everything mentality. Um, so giving is such a critical requirement for us. And, um, you know, there's a lot of freedom that comes when you give a lot of headspace freedom. I put myself out there in a place where I'm now actually relying on faith. Okay, so scripturally, you'll know um, that giving comes in the form of tithing. So Malachi 3.10, tithing is just not negotiable. Um, it's one of the basics that we are required to do. It is prioritizing what we get first and give to the Lord first, give to his house and his ministry first. And we know that the Bible promises a reward um, and that the storehouses will be so full if we do that. Um, and it's, this is not an insurance policy. We don't tithe to get either, but it is a basic foundation. And I have had countless, countless months in my life where on paper it wasn't working. And yet every month it worked. Um, and I, um, I don't understand that other than the fact that it was the Lord. Um, but from a numbers and adding perspective, which is what I do, and I find safety and security in numbers and adding, it never added up. But I always had enough. Okay. And then giving generously to others. Um, so 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7, if you want to go and look that up, talks about that. Um, and just in the South African context, and I've never spoken about black tax before in these kinds of sessions, but I, I said I've been praying about this session and I, you know, we have a social contract in this country. Um, and if you are black South African, um, you will know that the black tax is a reality for many, many South Africans. And there's nothing beautiful about the circumstances that created this position where so many are in need, so many of your family members are in need, so many demands are being placed on you. Um, and I'll never forget an article I read by a lady whose dad was going to retire from his job. Um, and he'd been working, you know, manual, hard, blue collar labor for a long time. And he was about to retire and his neighbor passed away and left two daughters as orphans. And her dad did not retire so that he could take over looking after those girls. And for a lot of us, that's not our reality, but for a lot of us, that really is. And as I say, um, as I was praying for the session, I just, I mean, the reason that the situation exists, there's nothing good about that. But God's heart and his joy and the delight that he feels when we take care of our communities and we step in and we give beyond what we can do. And I'm not making light of the difficulty and the suffering, but I just felt the Lord say that that is such a beautiful, beautiful heart. And I have to believe that the Lord will honor that in a very, very real way. So maybe that's an encouragement for you if you are stretched in all of these areas. And, and genuinely for all South Africans, we do have the social contract. If we have something, we have to give to those who do not. And I just, um, it's absolutely critical and vital for all of us. And it keeps us um, humble and yeah. 
So I hope you, you get that. So giving to the needy obviously ties in with that. Um, and we give unconditionally, even when the recipients cannot repay us. You know, so often you'll hear, don't lend to someone if you don't, if you're not happy to walk away from the money. I think that's absolutely true. Um, I don't like to lend to people. I just rather actually, you know, if they really are in need, I will give them, you know, what I can. Um, having said all of that, sometimes it's quite tricky to know when to give. So, you know, sometimes your heart has just moved so much and you absolutely give. And other times you'll be asked often in a context to give. Um, you know, and often in a church context, people want to go on missions and somebody else wants to study. And there's so many things and lots of opportunities to give. And it's quite hard to know what to do. Um, so Andrew and I sort of over the years have, we've sort of come up with the things that are closest to our heart that we believe the Lord um, requires us to give in. So one of ours is keeping families together. You know, so if, if a family is going to lose a child because of finances or somebody cannot adopt a child because they don't have the money for a social worker, all of those things, then we're your people. That is our heart and we will try and help as much as we can. Some of the other areas where, you know, we may be asked to give, we will say no. Um, we obviously can't give to everybody. So, um, so what I'm trying to say is, you know, outside of the people who are really desperate and, you know, we need to give them food and all of those things, there are spaces where... Um, I think it is a good idea to come up with where you do give and where you potentially, you know, don't, and you just trust the Lord that if we're all doing that, then, you know, all the needs will be covered. Okay, then we talk about income. All right, income. So there, there's, a, there's a cartoon for some light relief. So Dog Bird, the career counselor, what would you like to do with your degree in flower arranging? I'd like to be a billionaire. Are you willing to work hard? That would sort of defeat the purpose. Okay, so that's obviously not where I'm going with this. All right, so income is obviously what we would get from either our businesses or our jobs or whatever. Um, from a job perspective, there are ways that you can increase your earning potential, being good at what you do, putting yourself in line for promotion, and being diligent in your job. Obviously, you know, the hope, the hope there is that is recognized and rewarded. Um, and then you can also study further. Um, you know, this, it, it's not so easy when you're working and have a family and studying as well. But that is one way, if you possibly didn't do a degree, or you didn't finish matric or whatever, is to slowly but surely, over time, um, get a degree. I worked with a young man who in the middle, like I think in 1998, he started a UNISA degree at BCom, and he didn't have much money, didn't have much time. And he did sort of two units a year. And before we knew it, because years passed reasonably quickly, he had his degree. And it seemed like he had started so small. You know, it's a bit like the don't despise the day of small beginnings. It seemed like he'd started so small. But he, in the end, um, got that degree, you know, and it put him on a different tra trajectory. Okay, so that was actually beautiful to watch. All right. Um, then just from an income perspective, it is not the goal that you get so rich that you can stop working. Okay, there is no biblical precedent for not working. Okay, um, so, you know, we are actually supposed to work for our income. And, you know, it's less of a move now because of circumstances. But there was a big phase, you know, maybe 10 years ago that everybody was going to get passive income. We were all going to buy properties and we were all going to, you know, sit back and not have to work again and money would just come in. Um, so there's not really much godly and biblical about that. Um, so just be careful of if you're just chasing that income. So, you know, I, obviously, if you are owning properties and managing them, excellent, go for it. It's a good investment sometimes and, you know, hopefully you know what you're doing. But be very careful of assuming that that's passive income. If you've done it before, you will know it's not passive at all. You are in property management business. You are managing tenants. You are managing maintenance. You are having electricians, all sorts of things. It's a job. Okay. So they really, you know, that's questionable whether that's passive income. But that's not the goal. The goal is not to have, you know, I'm looking for so much money that I don't have to work. Okay, well, what will you do all day? How are you going to use the gift and talents that the Lord has given you? Okay, that requirement exists. So it is a bit of a tricky balance between not being driven by money and maximizing your earning potential. And again, it all comes down to the heart. You should be able to find this balance. You know, so um, it is not a problem at all to try and earn more, you know, if you need to earn more um, and, it, you know, it will make your circumstances and your stress level and everything else much lower, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. 
And again, it's not, it's about not chasing the money. Um, and it's, you know, that balance. All right. And again, decision making is often about more than just money. So we know lots of people who are highly capable, highly competent, who don't, who haven't put themselves in high corporate jobs to maximize their income. It's just not what they're called to do. Um, so I, you know, have a bit of a, a teaching element to me. Um, you know, I could have stayed in the corporate world and been an actuary there. You know, the, we don't go into lecturing for the money. Um, but, you know, that's where I'm supposed to be. So that's where I am. So, you know, um, it is very difficult if you are in a job, in a career where you don't feel like you fit, but you've sort of done it for the money and you've spent your income and you might in, be in debt up to the total of your income and you feel a little bit trapped. You know, so if that is you, then I encourage you to start putting in plans to get yourself out of that debt and out of that position and, and free to move into a place where you feel, okay, this is more me. Um, this is, you know, where I am best suited to use the gifts and talents that I've been given, even though it may mean I earn less money. Okay, spending. All right, so spending should be driven by a budget. Surprise, surprise. Okay, so the Bible obviously doesn't talk directly about the word budget, but it does say in Proverbs 27, 23, um, that you must be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. All right, so there's that element of measurement, of planning, of keeping track, of making sure you know what is yours and where it is, okay, and where it's going. Um, so if you have a budget, it helps you to have prioritized your spending. You've decided what's important, what goes into the budget, and it helps you avoid unnecessary and impulse spending. Okay, so once I've gone through this model, I'll just give you a, a few tips on sort of how to get started on all of this, where we'll talk about that kind of planning. Okay, but your budget comes out of your planning. What do we want to achieve? You know, what should, should our money do for us? Um, and once you've decided that and you've prioritized, it does help you stop impulse spending. So if you've agreed or you've decided that you'd like to um, save to go on a nice holiday, then spending a lot of money on a pair of shoes delays that holiday and that helps you to prioritize, you know, whether or not you're going to buy those shoes right now. Okay. And as I mentioned earlier with the car example, cheaper is not always better. Okay. So in some things, if it's exactly the same two items, then obviously, you know, the better deal is the better deal. Um, but, you know, buying something that is really cheap, um, that doesn't last, is not necessarily a wise decision always. Um, and again, you know, there's a lot of pride sometimes in how, how little money you have spent on something, which, as I said earlier, is also not good. Thing. Okay, so you can fund your spending in one of two ways. You can obviously spend cash or you can fund by going into debt and borrowing. All right, so for most items in general, we save before spending. Okay, so this is a good discipline to get into. We can all rush out and get store cards and buy the TV and whatever, but there is that element of saving before spending. Good discipline to wait, good discipline to have a plan. Okay, um, and then, you know, that does help you to avoid the unnecessary borrowing. Um, I used, when I taught the session before, we called it, you know, financial freedom. So, you know, you never want to be in a position where you have put yourself out of a position of financial freedom because of spending too much on debt. Okay, so this um, speaks to that, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Okay, so, you know, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Let's not put ourselves back into servanthood. Okay, so you don't want to become a slave through your borrowing. Okay, and I just want to say as well, you know, for some of us, we've made mistakes, you know, and it is okay if where you are right now is where you don't really want to be. Um, and some of this is about looking at what I've done. Maybe I've made a mistake. Maybe I am in debt. Maybe I, you know, made a couple of decisions I shouldn't have made. Um, and we've all done that. And it's useful in those circumstances. Very useful to be honest. Just own it, come out and say it, and try and find people to help you work out a plan to get out of it. So the first thing to do is just stop the unnecessary spending and then work out a plan to get yourself out of debt. But don't hide away in shame because mistakes have been made and debt has been created. As I say, speak to anyone who's ever spent any money. We've all done the thing and spent the thing we shouldn't have done. Okay, we, you know, 
you know, we'd like other people to learn from our mistakes. But if you have made a mistake, you know, don't, don't feel shameful about it. This is, you know, we've all fallen in this area. Okay, and then budgeting. So again, I said we'll talk a bit about planning just now, but be realistic in the budget. We can all draw up a budget that leaves us with lots of money at the end of the month, and we're not going to spend that much on food and whatever, and we know we're going to spend a lot of food. Okay, it's going to get out of hand because food is just expensive. All right, so budget realistically. Have a good sense of where you are and um, where your finances um, Sorry, I've just got some questions. So have a good sense of where you, are, where you are and what your finances will facilitate and what your income will do. Okay. Um, All right, so I'm going to take a couple of questions now. So if you want to, let's just go back to the passive income. If you want to ask a question, that's fine. Okay, um, so just a question around, um, you know, letting people know that you're giving or showing what you're giving. Um, so it is tricky, I think, to balance people's expectations and if you give. So um, especially with people that you know, you know, you may have given to them at some point in time um, and you may have felt moved to do that. Um, you know, maybe you've bought someone some clothes or you've done something kind for them. Um, and then does that create a greater expectation from them that you will do it again? Um, so I do think these things are quite difficult to navigate. Um, I think always put yourself in a position where if you give and you get nothing back, you are not going to be resentful. All right, you are happy to just let it go. If the person never says thank you, you're happy to let it go. Okay, so this is harder to do uh, than it sounds. Maybe it doesn't sound so easy anyway. Um, so, you know, and it is sometimes tricky to say no to somebody that you have already given something to. Um, and again, all of these things are a bit of a balance. Um, and sometimes people will be disappointed. And sometimes you will be the person who has been giving and somehow the person who has received will be offended, okay? <laughs> and this has happened and it will continue to happen, I suspect. And this is very hard. Um, and I think sometimes you need, you need to then just be a little bit tough and go, you know, I've done what I can do and actually I can't do more. And even if that other person is, is upset. So as I say, you know, try and only give when, you know, you're happy to give, you're gonna get nothing back, you might even not get a thank you back. Um, you know, and it's just about your heart to give, um, you know, and then you need to let it go. Okay, um, and then the question around passive income really exists. So the only space where passive income, I think, really exists is if you have an enormous uh, lump sum that you can potentially invest. So if you have had an inheritance. So I don't think passive income exists very easily when you are building your own wealth base. Then you will be starting businesses, you will be buying properties, you will be investing, you will be working, you know, sweating your assets kind of thing. So I think if you have inherited some money and you have a lump sum and you are able to invest that, you can potentially pay a small fee to an investment manager who will do the work for you. And then any income that you get on that investment is passive. So, um, so I think passive income can exist once you have built up um, a base of assets or inherited a base of assets. Um, so I think really the point around that is, you know, addressing that thinking that existed, uh, which I believe was wrong thinking a while ago around passive income is the thing. You know, we just find a way for money to just come in so we can do nothing. Okay. Um, and obviously that's uh, not right. Okay, so let's get back to budgeting. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, just be honest in your budget and thorough. So even if it shows that there's a hole, at least you know that there's a hole and you don't keep spending more and more into your hole. All right. And then you can relook at some of your, um, your expectations and, you know, what you can and cannot do with that income. Um, and also, you know, be careful of hidden expenses. So, um, you know, it's fine if you are buying an asset, for example, you want to buy a car. And then you can just afford the car repayments, but then, you know, don't forget that you need to save something potentially for car services, depending on the structure. And you, um, 
you'll have to obviously pay petrol, you'll have insurance, there are all sorts of things. If you are living in a house, there is a lot of maintenance spend that takes place. So you may only assess the bond repayment amount, but you know, there'll be other expenses, lots of money gets spent on a house. So you need to make sure if you're budgeting to purchase one of these things that you're taking all of these into account. Um, and the more complicated your life is, um, the more complicated your budget is, the more stuff you have, the more it takes to maintain, insure, look after, clean, whatever your stuff. Okay, so you need to budget and plan around all of those things. And then again, if you're possible, if you're, if you're able to allow some treat money, this isn't supposed to be a punishment. This is supposed to be a plan. What, I, what can I do with my income? You know, where, where are my priorities? Where am I going to spend? Um, you know, so if you are somebody who buys a cup of coffee every day at the office, you know, then put that in your budget. Okay. <clears throat> and then just a very simple example of a, a budget. So this is not a complete budget, but I just want you to have a look and see, this really does not have a mass, have to be a massively scary exercise. If you are not tech savvy or money savvy or whatever, um, you can do a very, very simple budget. So I just got on the one side, there's income after tax is 8,000. And then the outgo there, there's tired car, petrol insurance, car phone. You can just add it all up. And so far, all of that is 5150. Okay, what we know from there is that this person isn't living anywhere just yet. Um, so, but there's still money in the budget for that. So this can be as complicated as your budget looks. So it doesn't have to be very, very scary. It doesn't have to have 2,500 columns. It can really just, if you want to, you can manage this on an Excel spreadsheet or on a piece of paper. Um, you know, my mother growing up used to budget in a book. Um, she had a little hardcover A5 book and she used to spend a lot of time in the evenings writing and budgeting in the books you always knew exactly where everything was going okay so it doesn't have to be very very technical okay and then just some spending tips obviously grocery shopping is a big issue uh, and we know that even though it's lovely to sometimes take advantage of the conveniences that are available whether it's convenience food or convenience shops or other things that is more expensive and there's a premium there um, so Often you uh, are a bit punished if you haven't planned food or you haven't, you know, made time for something or if you run out of time, um, you know, it's a bit expensive to access convenience foods. All right, and be disciplined with perishable foods, especially if you live in a small household with only one or two people. It is really hard to buy fresh fruit and vegetables often enough and not have them waste. So some of these things, um, you know, are a bit of a balance and they sound like small things, but it actually can add up. All right, um, and then check the prices. So nowadays you'll see in labels at shops, regulatory requirements are that there is a per 100 gram cost on the, you know, the ticket that's under the item on the shelf. Um, you know, so compare those prices. Often we'll find, um, you can ask Caroline Webb next week, she buys in bulk a lot, and you'll often find that buying bulk is not always cheaper. So I think we've all assumed that buying bulk is cheaper, and so we sometimes just buy the bigger item or the bigger pack with 25 toilet rolls instead of nine, even though they are not always the, um, <laughs> even though Dave says she sure does, even though um, it's not always the cheapest thing to do. Okay, so sometimes I think we get a little bit suckered because we assume something. Okay. Um, all right, and then develop open-ended strategies. Uh, strategies for open-ended expenditure. Okay, so we know that cash expenditure is an issue. Um, you know, if you've got cash in your purse or your wallet, you know it's going to disappear. Um, so have a look and see, can you assess what your cash requirement is for a month and draw that once um, and then spend it over the month and don't draw cash again. Okay, so if we're constantly going back to the ATM and then the money's disappearing, we go, you know, these things can add up, even if it's a few hundred rand extra a month, that can be used for something else, and that's quite important. Okay, also cell phone airtime, if you on a uh, pay-as-you-go type contract and you're buying contract and buying airtime all the time, it's quite hard to know um, exactly what it is you've actually spent. So again, give yourself a budget, try and stick to it, um, use free Wi-Fi in places as much as you can, um, but, you know, it cannot just, just look for all these places basically the message where there are potentially open-ended areas of expenditure for you and work out strategies for you 
as to how to um, how to manage those. And then always ask for a discount. So I learned this from my husband, who uh, the first few times he did it, I wanted to die of embarrassment in the shop because of my need to uh, not, well, I don't know if my need to impress my fear of man, whatever it is, how could you possibly put us in a position where they think we can't afford the full price of this thing? And then I should see that, you know, the number of times we actually did get a discount in these circumstances was quite significant and it saves us a lot of money. So, um, you know, sometimes it's a good thing to swallow your pride and go, who can I talk to you about doing a deal on this item? Um, and actually, particularly at the moment, you know, that there are a lot of places that, um, you know, your business is important to them um, and they'll be willing to talk about discounts. Um, so don't be shy. If they say no, they say no. But if they say yes, you've saved. It's after tax savings, really, which is a good thing. Okay, it's just resting for a bit. Okay. And then borrowing. So this is also still in the spending area when we are borrowing to purchase. So as I mentioned earlier, get serious about saving before purchasing. Um, avoid borrowing to, buy for an asset, to, buy, to pay for an asset that does not grow in value. Okay, so um, you are going to be in some form of financial trouble if you owe more on an asset uh, than the asset is worth. All right, so houses, as we know, if you haven't overspent on the purchase price of the house, probably the only way you're going to be able to access the house is to borrow money to buy it. Um, and then hopefully if you've not overspent on it, the house value will increase, your amount that you owe will decrease, and if you had to then sell the house, you would have enough to pay for what you owe. All right, so you're not really um, in financial prison then. You are sort of in financial prison if you owe more than what an asset is worth, okay? Um, so must, you must understand how debt works. So I'm gonna give you a quick um, bond example in a minute. Um, avoid danger debt, it's easy to get and very expensive. So these are the ones you're getting the SMS, you know, you've been awarded a 50,000 Rand loan, fabulous for you. Um, you know, that kind of debt is very, very dangerous, very expensive. And how we measure expensive in a debt is the interest rate that's being charged. So we often think our bond is our big debt. Your bond is probably on the lowest interest rate of all the borrowings that you have. So it's actually your cheapest borrowings, even though the repayment amount is probably the most. All right, so avoid these easy to get. Um, if you access a few of those before you know it, your debt position is a lot higher than you think it is. Okay, so I say they always know your total debt position and the more complicated it is and the more numbers you have to add up to work out your total debt position, the harder it is to manage. Okay, so if that is you, um, then I recommend that you do some simplification of that. If you do have a bond and you've got a bit of capacity in the bond, you know, you can maybe pay off some of your more expensive debt going to have a look and see what am I paying in an interest rate percentage on all of my borrowings and, you know, settle the most expensive ones, the ones with the highest interest rates, um, you know, and try and swap them out and pay for those ones in full and swap them out until you're left with the debt that is the cheapest debt from an interest rate perspective and also the debt that you have an asset backing that debt. Okay. Um, but it is very hard for any of us to keep track of our debt if we are have a lot of it and a lot of it in different places. Sorry, the pop-up with the chat is always a little bit slow. Okay. Oh, such a good question. Thank you. So I meant to say this. Um, when you're asking for a discount, always be very careful of the power balance in that scenario. Okay, so you don't ask for a discount from a trader on the side of the road and this may be his, you know, his meal and you have all the power and he does not have all the power. Okay, um, so, you know, don't push for a discount in those circumstances. So watch for the power balance. So if you are in a normal retailer and you ask the salesman and he's got a certain amount of leeway on his own, you know, he's got a salary that's going to be paid anyway, he might earn commission, he's going to earn commission on the sale anyway, you know, and he might have some leeway to give you a 5% discount or whatever. So that's absolutely fine. But if there's a power imbalance and it's an informal trader or a small business or somebody who doesn't have the money to give you, but will give it to you anyway because they're so desperate for the sale. Okay, that's not a good idea. So thank you for that reminder. I did want to highlight that. 
Okay, so just watch that power balance. If you have all the power, that's not the space to be asking for a discount. Okay. Um, and then also don't push too much for a discount that you make it not worth the other sides, um, not worth their while, and that it could jeopardize your, um, you know, the, the result, the work that they do and the, um, the resulting, you know, outcome. So it is a bit of a balance. So I'm sorry, I was a bit blase about that. But um, yeah, so just be careful in those spaces and, and just watch you know, how far you push it. Um, it should be a space where both of you end up in a happy place. Okay. Um, but a lot of what we know is that a lot of retailers, there's so much fat in their pricing that they're actually still happy to sell you something with a 5% discount. Okay, so in those, space, in those spaces, it's worth a try. Okay, so just um, spending on a credit card. Um, so again, a credit card is danger debt if you are using it as debt. Um, it's, a, it's an expensive way of borrowing if you are in credit. So you'll know, I mean, we've all done it sometimes when we are a bit desperate, we've bought something on our credit card over the six month payment period. And that is very expensive. The interest rate is very high. Okay, so avoid using the credit card as credit. Um, you know, it's not a bad idea to use the credit card as almost your float for the month and you repay it at the end of the month. So have a look at your um, at your budget every month and see you know what limits on the credit card. Um, uh, have a look and see what limits you have uh, on your credit card, how much you need you know in the month, such that you can still settle it next month in full, so that you're using it as a sort of um, a bank account in a way and also building up your um, your credit record. So in those instances, you're using your credit card to pay, but you're actually not going into debt. By using your credit card if that makes sense okay um just on the teenagers one we'll do it later when we do general planning i'll i'll carry we'll talk about it then so remind me then please on teenagers budgeting okay um so yeah so credit card i would not advise you to go into debt on it but you can actually just use it almost as a debit card as long as you managing it and limit keep your credit limit small enough that it allows you to spend every month but um you um, uh, you can pay it off at the end of the month. Okay. So have a look and see what you need it to be for your budget. Don't have it so big that you have, you know, that you're tempted to go into credit. Just don't make that available for you. Okay. So um, in terms of consolidating debt, so that is what I mean when I say like the simplification. So go through all your debt and see if there's space in your bond. Can you settle another account taking money out of your bond and paying for that? because that you know, bond interest rate may be cheaper. So there's definitely space for debt consolidation. I would advise, you know, as far as possible, don't have too much little bits of debt in too many places. Um, you, know, you, can get, um, you can get a lot, a better handle on your debt if you, um, if you consolidate. Okay. Um, also on the debt issue, um, in terms of the National Credit Act, if you do need help, you can um, go to the National Credit Regulator website and you can go and find debt counseling. So if you are in, in trouble from a debt perspective, you can get debt relief, you can ask someone to help you and um, you, they will actually take you through the process of how do you um, consolidate your debt, how do you approach creditors, they will actually approach creditors for you if you are in financial trouble and they'll help you work out a payment plan because sometimes you can revise a payment plan. Okay, let me deal with these questions that are coming through. Um, okay, so readjusting your budget. So it becomes a little bit, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's a bit of a balance between how much time are you spending on managing your finances and budgets and how much time you're spending on other things. So certainly I think when you're starting the process, you'll probably have to readjust your budget quite often. Um, and I would suggest, um, I've got a, a, on the last slide with questions, there are like four apps um, that the experts recommend. Um, and they're quite different apps, so you can play with different ones and see what works for you, if anything works for you. Um, but certainly when you're starting, you will probably um, get your budget wrong, you'll have forgotten something. And then as you are spending and other things are happening, you're realizing that actually my budget is out here and whatever. So then, you know, almost adjust it as you go. Um, you know, so if you've realized you've just left an item out, you know, petrol, oh dear, go and add it in immediately when you've realized it. Um, so keep it as a working document. 
at some point in time it will sort of stabilize and then you'll have a sense of um you know maybe on a on a every two weeks basis we can look at it or even on a once once a month basis we can have a look at it okay and again also depending on how tight your budget is so i mentioned earlier when andrew was retrenched um we also had a phase where um his stepmom passed away and um he is the only heir so he did inherit her property in cape town but there is no money the estate is still not wound up um and so at the time in which he didn't have any work um we had to basically take over you know the payment for rates and taxes on her house and water and light on the house and all sorts of other things um so in those instances we were managing our cash every day okay so we were moving money from point A to point B to pay this and whatever. So in those instances, we were adjusting our budget every day. Okay, so it kind of depends. It's just flexible in what you need when. Okay. Um, okay, so guys, you are asking me individual advice about what to do with your stocks. Unfortunately, you might have missed my uh, disclaimer in the beginning. I can't give you advice on what to do with money at the moment um, or ever. So I'm not licensed to give individual financial advice. So I can't actually tell you what, um, what you could um, invest in. We will talk about investments just now um, in general. So hopefully that'll give you some ideas. Okay, so just in terms of building credit. Um, so, you know, if you are one day planning maybe on buying a house um, and, you know, even these days when you're applying for some schools or universities, they will often ask you for permission to do a credit check on yourself. And if you have a credit rating and you're, um, you know, you've borrowed money or you've got a credit card and you've managed your money well, you have a credit rating. And um, so that is what I said earlier about what you can sometimes use your credit card for is that it gives you a bit of a credit score. Um, so you will have a good credit score if you've not ever been handed over or not paying debt or or not paying accounts. So you're going to have a good credit score anyway if none of those things, if you haven't you know, had any judgments against you. Um, but it's just sort of building up this base of evidence almost um, around how you manage your money. So sometimes having a credit card and being able to pay it off every month, even though maybe that's what you budgeted to do, um, that sort of build credibility around your ability to manage money. Okay. So just having a quick look at how a bond might work for those of you who are thinking of doing this at some point. And again, um, a lot of these things, if you've never done this before, it's a good idea to get some advice or to ask someone who has done it before. Um, we've all done it. We've done it, some of us better than others. We've made mistakes, you know, feel free to ask and uh, learn from people who've, who've done it. So if you're in the first month, if you borrow 500,000 Rand uh, at an interest rate of 10%, one month's interest is 416667. So the way that this would work is at the end of the month, you owe 5416667. There's your bond repayment. That would be the actual one at 10%. And then the new amount owed at the end of the month is 4993.4156. Okay. So my big reveal any minute now. Okay, so you've paid your full repayment of 4H2511, but the amount owing has only gone down by 658 Rand and 44. Okay, so that is because 4,166 Rand and 67 cents of this has gone into interest. Okay, so that is lost to you. Okay, so that 500,000, would cost you 1.158 million over the 20 year of the bond. Okay, so if you don't know this and you don't know how these bonds work, then don't enter into this arrangement until you are clear on how this works. Okay, so if you were to pay an extra 500 Rand in each month, you could pay off instead of in 20 years, you would pay off in 15 years and four months and you'd save 180,000 Rand nearly in interest. Okay, so almost all of the bank websites have got the numbers that you can go and work out um, if you did, you know, paid extra higher deposits, all the rest of it, what would happen? Um, so it's a good idea to go and play on some of those. Um, they're very easy to find. I think if you just go on the .co.za website, their calculator is right there. Okay. Um, so if you were to pay no extra, the second month over there works exactly the same as the one on the slide before. So you owe the five four nine nine three forty one fifty six from the previous slide. 
The interest has come down slightly because you owe slightly less. Okay, so the interest is 4161. At the, at the end of the month, you now owe 498. Um, the bond repayment um, at month end, sorry, the, the amount you owe after the bond repayment is 4986763. Okay, so if you had paid an extra in month one, the interest in month two would come down only a small amount by four rand. So it's not 416118, it's 415701. Okay, and your bond repayment there is 500 rand more. And the amount that you owe after that is 497673. Okay, so these are a lot of numbers and you can always have these slides with the greatest of pleasure and you can have a look at it. But the bottom line is all of those tiny amounts of interest that you are not paying if you're paying an extra accumulate to that 180,000 rand interest that you save. So every little bit extra that you put in pays off the actual amount that you owe, the actual capital of the bond. That means you pay slightly less interest and that adds up over time and your interest payments reduce more quickly over time and it accumulates quite quickly. So if you're able to do that, that's quite a powerful tool. Okay, so just very quickly on cars. Um, so there are a lot of ways to make a mistake in car purchases. They are quite emotional. Um, and the repayments work exactly the same as the bond. So you'll owe a certain amount of money. Um, you will repay monthly. Uh, you'll obviously pay over much shorter terms. The so cars are paid off over four years or five years. Okay, so just be very careful in that cars are not an investment. All right, so cars depreciate very quickly. Um, and it is sometimes quite easy, especially at the high end of the market, if they're very expensive cars, it's quite easy to owe more on the car than the car is worth. And that is a very difficult position to be in because if something happens to the car um, or you have to replace it or it's stolen or it's written off or something, you could potentially be in a position where you have to pay off extra on the car for an asset that you no longer have plus replace the asset. All right, so for cars, it's often... Um, it's often important to see what will this car be worth in a year's time um, and manage the purchase of this quite carefully. Okay, so, okay. you know, it might be worth it for you to buy the car in a year's time and let somebody else pay the depreciation or that drop in value rather than you run that risk. Okay, so obviously it's totally up to you, but just be aware of the risks here with cars. And again, um, ask for advice if you um, are feeling a bit of insecurity in this area. Okay, and then just watch with cars as well. So the new lease arrangements give the cars the impression of being much more accessible maybe than they actually are. So, um, you know, the lease uh, means that you're effectively renting the car for the period and then you pay off an amount of money still at the end. Um, and um, if you haven't got that amount of money to still pay at the end, it's often called the balloon payment, then you basically give the car back. So you're renting the car and then if you can pay the balloon payment at the end you do and you keep the car and if you can't then you hand the car back and you basically buy another one all right so just be aware of that there's nothing wrong with that um often businesses do this uh, but if you don't know about the balloon payment the car looks more affordable than it is because the monthly payments are smaller than they would have been if there wasn't a balloon payment Okay, so just in terms of house purchases as well. Um, uh, the question around how do you not overpay on a house? So I think the house really is trying to get good advice around what property prices are in a particular area. So it is quite hard if you walk into an area cold um, and you fall in love with a house and you just want that house and it's within the budget. It's hard to know, okay, well, am I paying too much or too little for this house? Um, and I mean, we all know that the house purchase as well, it is going to be where you live, you know, so there's a lot of heart involved. And again, it's not all about money only, um, but try and find out as far as you can, what is the average price for this type of property in this type of market in this area? Um, you know, so common advice around house purchases is, you know, buy the cheapest house you can in the best area. Okay, so... Um, you know, the idea being their best areas are the areas that maintain their house property values the most. Um, but again, so the difficulty with house purchases is it's just the size of it. You are probably going to go into debt to access this house. Um, 
and yet you're going to live in it and you want to love it and you want to love where you are living. Um, so it is a difficult decision to make. So that I think the bottom line is try not to rush it. Try and do all your research and get as much advice as you can. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, so, the, I mean, the biggest mistake you can make in a house really is overspending on it. Um, however, that mistake also decreases with time if you're going to stay in the house for 50 years and you just love it. And it also does depend sort of on how much flexibility you have in your budget. So all of these things is very hard. It's, there's no yes, right answer, no wrong answer. It's a very personal thing and it does depend on your finances. So I guess it's just about making the wisest decision you can. Take your time and, um, you know, get as much advice as you can. Okay, so the question of renting versus buying, again, um, depends on your... Um, personal circumstances and preferences. So there is no right or wrong way. Um, the idea with a house purchase is it's potentially a long-term investment and helps you with a long-term uh, sort of wealth creation plan. So you can potentially then invest in this house and pay this house off over time and then you have the house. Um, again, it's not a perfect decision. So, you know, I know people who've chosen to rent because it just gives them that much more freedom. So renting, they could consider it's just we're just wasting money every month. We're spending 5,000 rand a month on rent. We could be spending on a bond. And that is absolutely true, but it's not the only decision. Okay, so, you know, you don't have the debt then, and that's a decision you're going to have to take. Do you need the freedom? You know, you are tied to this property. You're tied to this house. Um, so it's really about a whole lot of things. It's very hard to say at an individual level what's better for everybody. Um, you know, for most people who sort of following a conventional type tra trajectory, which you may or may not be doing, you know, you often have your first job and you cannot afford to buy a house and you rent for a while until you can maybe save for a deposit and then you purchase a house and, you know, but um, that may not be the path for everybody. Uh, so it's quite tricky to know, you know, for everybody what that answer is. But again, um, you know, these are big decisions. So it is worth spending time on them. It's worth getting as much individual advice as you can. Um, uh, we did some counseling, marriage counseling, financial counseling with a couple a while ago who had bought an investment property and he was doing the bond on his side. She was doing the other expenses and the rental on her side. Um, and they sort of had been married for a long time and they didn't really talk about their finances too often, put them together. I think they sort of, you know, assumed everything was fine. And when we sat with them and worked through their finances, they were making a big, big loss on this property that had, they had purchased and they were renting out. And because they had their finances separately and the one side was on his balance sheet and the other side was on her account, they didn't really know that actually every month they were losing money on this investment. Okay, so just, again, um, keep track of these things if you can, as closely as possible as you can. Um, just a question on car leases versus buying the car outright. Um, you know, again, they have become very popular. Car leases in South Africa have become very popular. Lots of agreements are lease agreements. So always check before you buy something, is this a lease agreement with a bullion payment or if it's not. Um, so, you know, you um, just never enter into an agreement you don't fully understand. And again, it's about what works for you. So for a lot of businesses, you know, often just rent, paying that rental amount for a car is fine. And then they just um, sort of upgrade to another car or never pay the bullion payment. Okay. Um, so in terms of paying a deposit on a car, um, so I think always for me, it's around you know, managing the whole process. So the more you pay upfront on the car, the less your repayments will be, the lower risk you have that if something happens to that car and your insurance doesn't cover the full amount, the lower the risk is that you owe more on the car than you will get back from an insurance policy, for example. Um, so, you know, I'm always wary of blanket advice, don't pay a deposit on a car or do pay or lease or buy, you know, everybody's circumstances are different. Um, you know, sometimes it's a tax issue, all these things come into play. Um, so for me, it's really about understanding the agreement that you're entering into, understanding what other agreements and what other options are available to you and making the best decision for you. Okay. Um, and again, car paying it cash or not, um, is it considered a waste to pay a huge lump sum of cash on a depreciating asset? Um, 
So again, yes and no. So you can pay cash on it. The asset is going to depreciate, depreciate, but then you save the full interest payment that you would on a loan agreement. You know, you're going to borrow money to pay off the car. So you're going to pay off this monthly amount and a lot of it's going to go to interest. So again, it's about what works best for you. And if you have the cash, you don't pay, um, you don't pay the interest payment. Okay. Um, so I would almost say if you had the cash to pay a car, that doesn't sound like a terrible idea. Um, but again, you know, it's a very personal decision and everybody will make a different decision. There isn't a perfect answer. Okay, but you pay cash, do not pay the interest, not because the asset is depreciating. Okay, and again, the depreciation on the asset doesn't really matter if you're planning on keeping the car for 20 years. You know, if you're going to keep it for a long time, that's fine. It's just where you are in that risky position where if, you know, you write the car off or if it's stolen and you owe more, then it's worse. Okay, then, then that's the position that you actually want to avoid. Okay. Saving. Okay, so savings can be short term or long term. Usually for short term savings, we're talking about sort of major household purchases. So furniture, TVs, car services, all the rest of it. So you have an account that you're saving into. Um, also, you can save for holidays. Uh, and you should usually would save these in some kind of bank account. And most banks these days have got a facility that you can almost set up your own savings account and do it yourself. And it's not too expensive to do that. Okay, and savings would also then be longer term. So you have rainy day savings. Um, so, you know, there's a bit of conventional wisdom out there that you should have three months worth of your salary available, um, you know, for a rainy day. Um, and obviously you could have longer term savings for education or various other things. And if the longer the term is, you know, you might want to move it into something other than just a straightforward cash bank account. Some kind of a longer term investment vehicle might work there. Okay, so just in terms of saving tips, again, it'll kind of be part of your plan and your budget. Um, you save early in the month, okay? So it's not gonna be ever going to work that you say, oh, I'll see what's left and then save that. Okay, you and I both know there will be nothing left, okay? Um, we'll look very good and our nails will be done, but nothing will be left. Okay, so save early in the month, take it out of the bank account early. So if you have your budget and you have your plan and you know how much you're intending to save, take it out first. Okay, to try every, you know, every year when you get a bit of a salary increase to increase your good habits, you know, so if you can, um, and not everything has gone up by as much as your salary increase, try and use that moment uh, to not spend your entire annual raise to give more, to save more, to pay off more debt. Okay, so that's a good time once a year to sort of relook the whole budget and see, can I start saving a little bit more? So small is really good in terms of saving terms. Um, so often we think, oh, I can only save 500 rand a month. It's not worth it. It really is worth it. So start, partly because it's a discipline thing. Um, and definitely those of you asking about teenagers and other things, this is an excellent habit, you know, to sort of start forming early. Um, you know, give them a sense of how saving actually can work for them. Um, the power of compound interest, as everyone always says. Okay, so don't not save just because it's a small amount. Okay, you are guaranteed to have zero at the end if you never save. Um, you know, and you will have something substantial, even if you save a little bit for a long period of time. Okay, and investing is sort of the more complicated, more higher grade version of saving. So most of us that save, we understand saving, we put aside a bit of money. Um, investing is, tends to be um, a bit longer term. This is where you have additional disposable money that you think you don't need for a long period of time that you can invest in a longer term investment vehicle for the long term. Okay, so often you would get financial advice here. Um, you would have investment vehicles, as they call, uh, that are specifically designed for this purpose. So you could buy shares directly. You could obviously invest in property. You can invest in property unit trusts or unit trusts and shares. So all sorts of investments you could potentially invest in. Um, and this is also you know, long-term investment for, for things like retirement or wealth creation. Okay, um, so again here, it usually requires expert advice. Um, lots of costs and hidden taxes and other things involved in these. So it's not always that easy to know upfront, you know, when you're comparing one thing to another. Um, so it's a very good space to get proper financial advice here. Um, you know, if you're investing on your own, um, the goal with this is to assume 
long term uh, and to be able to trust that over the long term your assets will grow. So if you're going to be investing in the stock market and you're really stressed, I mean, the person who asked earlier about a million rand, you know, potentially to invest, you know, if you're going to invest that and you're going to have to watch that money every day and stress about stock market fluctuations, because it's going to go up and it's going to come down and you're going to be out of control. You don't have any control over that. Um, you know, so you've almost got to be, if you're going to be investing in this kind of vehicle, you've got to be free to assume that stock market investments are supposed to be long-term, you're supposed to get long-term inflationary increases over the long-term and, you know, 10 years longer. Um, and, you know, the mindset is I'm going to leave this in here for longer-term wealth creation. If I'm going to stress because this is very important money to me, um, you know, and, and if my capital drops a little bit, then it's a source of huge stress for me. Then, you know, get some advice about some of the other options. There are some that are a bit more conservative and a bit more stable and your capital doesn't fluctuate so much. So again, it's a very personal thing. Um, and again, it's one of those where your heart comes into play. Uh, often you will have friends who will come and, you know, they've got a brilliant business for you to invest in or they've got a brilliant investment plan and you're going to double your money in three days and it's going to be amazing. Okay, so we know that if it looks too good to be true, it will be. Okay, so again, this is about wisdom, long-term Wealth creation is not really about uh, chasing quick returns in the investment space. Okay. Um, okay, so the question I mean, savings versus investments, so it really depends on you as an individual. So, savings in your terms of your personal space, um, you know, it depends on, on your income. You may be able to fund holidays from your short term savings. Um, you know, you may not have kids, you don't need a savings fund for education or other things, um, you know, and you may prioritize long-term wealth creation, in which case sort of short-term spending, you might sacrifice, um, you know, a holiday for long-term investing. So again, it's entirely uh, your, your plan um, and how it is you've decided to manage your, um, your investments. And also savings and investments can look very much the same if you're investing in the same actual asset. Okay, so, you know, saving isn't going to grow super quickly if it's in a bank account earning cash returns. But if you've put some savings into a unit trust, you could also have long-term investments in a unit trust, you know, and then they, they will grow effectively at the same rate. Okay. In, the idea with investing is sort of this is the space where you don't mind if you don't touch this money for a very long time, period of time. You know, saving, sometimes you will dip into them for emergencies or you know, because you saved for something and you're going to spend it on that. Okay, so just some investing for retirement ideas. Um, I say this with a big caveat because, you know, you may never stop actually working. You know, you may still be functioning and very healthy and well and your brain will be brilliant in the, your 90s. So, you know, don't stop working in your 60s. What are you going to do for the other 30 years? You know, just saying. I mean, obviously it's up to you, but however, the workforce may force you to retire and then you need a plan. Okay, so saving is obviously better. The sooner the better. Um, you start saving now for later life. Uh, just a quick example there. If you're currently 25 and you want to stop earning at 60, you need to be saving about 10% of your salary to replace 50% of your salary at retirement. Okay, so that's a long savings plan to save half of your salary, to repay half your salary. And you need to be paying about 14% of your salary now to replace about 75% of your salary at retirement. Okay, the later you retire, the better those numbers look. Okay, so it gets very much better when you're retiring at 65 or later. Okay, so in South Africa, it's got very significant tax savings uh, incentives for saving in retirement funds. So, you know, it's something to possibly be looking at um, if you don't yet have any kind of savings in that space. All right, and then the last aspect of the Formal model is just protection, you know, so having a look and see what insurances do you need, what life insurance, disability, assets, medical aid, business insurance, all of those things, and then some sort of a will to protect your loved ones. Okay, what if something unforeseen happens, what happens the next day? Who's got access to what bank accounts? You know, don't, um, you know, don't leave your family with you having not left a will and then, you know, things go into the state for a very, very long period of time and they'll basically unprotected. Okay, so some of these basics. Okay, so just in terms of that planning process we spoke about earlier, so this is also useful to take teenagers through. Okay, so obviously depending on how complicated their worlds are or otherwise, 
um, you know, to start off with some kind of a picture of your current financial situation, your total earnings, debt, insurances, savings, all the rest of it. And just think about how you're currently managing your finances. All right. And then you look at what are my current responsibilities? I have a bond. I have school fees. I need to pay food. I have to pay phones. I have to pay all sorts of things. Okay. And then a, a wish list items, you know, and some sort of a timeline. We'd like to go on holiday at the end of next year or whatever it is. Have a, you know, some sort of a plan of what are my responsibilities that I can't avoid and sort of what are the things I would like and when would I like to be able to do those things. And based on those sort of, you know, just lists of priorities and wish lists, draw up a plan. So that prioritizes your, priori your responsibilities and the items on your wish list. So some of your priorities are not negotiable, they must be paid. Some of them are negotiable and, you know, start weighing up my wish list versus what I thought was my responsibilities. Can I prioritize them so that when I come to allocating money to them, at some point in time, I have this long list in priority order and I will run out of money. So that I know the ones at the bottom that I'm not going to get to are not my priority items. Okay, so there may be some items in your wish list that you can push up if you know the priorities work out that way. And that's based on that kind of plan that you then draw up the budget. So how much you're going to spend on all of these items um, and see how far your income will take you. And it does require a few iterations. I thought I could afford this, but I actually can't, or I could afford more than I thought I could. And you sort of juggle your budget a little bit. And then as we spoke about earlier, you, um, you will have missed something or overcounted something or whatever, and you will adjust this as well. Um, and then draw up a list of to-dos to implement the plan. So, you know, you had insurances in there, but you actually don't have the insurance policy yet. So maybe you need to go and get a medical aid or get life cover or whatever it is. Okay, so there will be some things that you need to do to implement your plan. And then you start go, and then you get going, you know. Um, so don't get into analysis paralysis, rather have something of a plan, have a good idea of sort of what you can afford, where you are, get started, and very soon you'll be able to figure out, you know, what you've missed, where you've made a mistake, um, and then you can change that regularly. Okay, sorry, I saw something in the chat which is now not appearing. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, so advice on debt insurance, uh, especially for big assets. So if you're borrowing money from a bank, the bank will make you take life insurance um, to cover the payment outstanding should you pass away and no longer be able to pay your, um, your what you owe on the house. Uh, debt insurance in terms of taking out insurance on credit and you not actually being able to pay, you really can only get that on debt. So you can get credit insurance should you pass away and not be able, and again, short-term retailers and all the rest would almost make you do this. Uh, I don't think that's very moral, but they do. Um, so you can't actually get insurance just because I may default on my debt, okay. Um, but you, in terms of life insurance for that, you can get it, but not really for um, it's not really an insurable risk that somebody might default. Okay. So the risk there, I suppose, is that you've lost your income. And that is sort of where you can get income protection should you get disabled or something happen. So that you protect the income and therefore protect your ability to pay debts. Okay. Sorry, time is marching. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, there was just a question around what a unit trust is. So very simply, a unit trust is a way that you and I can get access to the stock market without going directly into the JSE, the Janusburg Stock Exchange, and buying shares directly. So what a unit trust is, it's basically a package of shares. Um, and you know, an investment company goes and buys a whole lot of shares for us um, and packages them in something called a unit trust. And you can then go and almost buy units. So if the whole portfolio of shares is worth a million rand and they are selling a million units, then every unit is worth one rand. And you can go and buy 10,000 rands worth and get 10,000 units. And then as the prices of the shares grow, the value of those units changes. So it's really just if you don't have a massive amount of money to go and buy individual shares and you don't have the expertise anywhere, which most of us don't, you can access shares in the stock market through these vehicles called unit trusts. 
So it's basically just a collection of shares in a big portfolio that has a particular price based on the value of all those shares. And you can go and buy some units in that and access it. Okay. All right. Okay, so then just talking about COVID-19 and where we find ourselves at the moment. So for some of us, we are in pretty different spaces as far as this goes. Let me just see if this. Um, so pretty different spaces as far as this goes. So I do think what has happened for all of us is what we thought mattered might need revising in this space. So we've had a lot of time spent in a very different way of living and it is a good opportunity at this point to realize what matters and what does not matter. Um, and for some of us from an income perspective and how we live perspective and what we can do, um, maybe some of the picture of what we thought was important, we've had to let go of. Um, so it's a bit of a reflection, I think, for most people in that, you know, um, it's changed for all of us. Some of us, it's, we're still okay. Some of us have just been traumatic and very, very, very hard. Uh, but I think for all of us, we've had a revision of priorities. Um, so on the one side of the scale, those who are still employed, you've probably got more disposable income now than you did before. Okay, so all of our interest rates on our loans have gone down dramatically. We're spending significantly less money getting to work. Uh, petrol prices have dropped, you know, for a long time there. There was no takeaway option. There was no convenience foods, uh, you know, and... Property prices have fallen, so if you were in the property market, you could potentially be buying property, um, you know, at a better price than previously. So I do think that this has created a greater requirement on us to give. Um, so, you know, like for us as a family, we had some savings, we had some plans, and I've just taken you through all these plans and all this lovely theory, and, you know, we've got some plans, we had some savings that we were going to set aside for the kids, and we actually just gave it away. So sometimes there's theory and there's reality. So we felt on our hearts, actually, you know, we've still got more time to save for the kids that are 10, I mean, they're 11 and 13, you know. Um, we've got a few years to get their education fund up and running or whatever it is. Um, people aren't dying in need right now. So again, I think it's been a bit of an adjustment of our priorities. What's important actually right now, holding on to our savings just felt a bit wrong. Okay, so maybe not always the most amazingly wise decision, but it was the right thing to do. Okay. Um, so then the, some of us have had our income reduced. So Andrew's company has cut salaries, so his income has reduced. Um, and, you know, this is now very hard for a lot of people. Um, and I think it's a reality for a significant number of people. So we know that the government has put in place a temporary employees relief scheme, the UIF, and that pays for a few months, uh, about six and a half thousand rand. Um, which does fill the hole for some. So you can claim this even if you are still working, but you've had a salary cut. Okay, so you can help reduce some of that income. The, the legislation has also changed around retirement contributions. So if you were part of a fund, those contributions were compulsory. At the moment, they are not compulsory. So some funds have got quite higher contributions, 15%, 20%. So if you don't contribute for a few months to those, Again, you know, sometimes the long-term planning at this point in time um, will take a backseat to, you know, immediate needs. Uh, so if you are in a space with your employer, you can potentially approach your employer. If they haven't yet implemented this, um, this can be implemented and then you can stop saving into those retirement savings for a period of time. Okay, so that regulation has been uh, passed. So also a good idea at this point is to have a look and see, can you reduce some costs some way? Um, so, you know, we reduced our car insurance costs because they're sitting in the garage, you know, so there's a theft risk potentially, but, you know, we're not driving anyway, so third party risk is not necessarily a risk for us at the moment. Um, but again, quite a lot of service providers and other people, you know, everyone's taking a bit of strain. So there's quite a high commitment for people to keep each other going a little bit. Um, so speak to those who, you know, you owe money to and see what you can do in terms of payment plans, you know, can you reduce rental for a while? Um, and, you know, speak to your service providers and see what is possible. Um, so I think this is a change at a, obviously at a massive level across the board for everybody. Um, and so, you know, if you're in financial difficulty now, no one is really gonna go, oh, you know, you, 
you don't plan your life properly, you've got yourself into this mess. You know, so I think there's no shame in asking for help right now. I think everybody understands that times are unprecedented. Okay, we've never had anything like this before. And there is quite a lot of grace um, being extended to people who are really having a difficult time. Okay, and then this is the last, um, the last category. And there's really nothing easy about this. I think this is where the heartbreaking space where so many people are finding themselves. And this is where you know, you've lost employment. And, um, you know, it is now is a difficult time to, to try and refund uh, formal employment. And it does obviously also depend on the sector, how hard or easy that is. Um, you know, and I mentioned earlier that Andrew was retrenched and whatever. And it is a very, very emotional and very difficult thing to pick yourself up from. I think uh, my husband played PlayStation for two months solid. It was his coping mechanism. And, you know, he pretty much never did it again. Um, but it was very, very hard. And I think the emotional element of it cannot be underestimated. Um, I think also the reality here is, I mean, and we had a travel business and that has been shut. And again, the emotional trauma of retrenching a whole lot of people. Um, you know, and it is very personal and very close, even though everybody understands why it is just so hard. Um, so I think, you know, the encouragement is just, um, you know, God is still in control. And I don't think there's an easy answer here. This is just very hard. And, but I, you know, in praying this, I just felt the Lord, you know, um, asking, you know, what is in your hand? What can you do? What is it, you know, if you are in an emotional state to pick yourself a little bit and have a look and say, Lord, what is it in my hand? What have you given me? Um, you know, Moses was, was pretty much a nobody and he was sent in to, to Pharaoh to challenge slavery in Egypt and he said Lord they're not going to believe me they're not going to know that you spoke to me and God said to him you know what's in your hand and he had like a stocky you know a staff in his hand um you know and I just sense that the Lord is asking for some of us you know what's in your hand he's given you something um you know and if you give it back to him if you throw it on the ground he will transform it into something that is living um you know so so this is really hard and I um I was going to say something else about the travel business I can't remember Oh, just um, so many people. And I mean, we often, and I mentioned it earlier, you know, you often feel people are in financial difficulty because of a mistake they've made or they've done it to themselves. And I think in this space, it's, it's, you know, so many people have done everything right. You know, you've managed your finances well, you've tired, you've prayed, you've committed everything to the Lord, and then, you know, you've lost your job. Um, you know, so it's, this is not, a, it's a very leveling thing. It's not a, there's no meritocracy here, you know, so... It's not an indication of your faithfulness or God's love for you or, you know, your future. Um, you know, God will provide plans for you. Um, you know, we've also seen new opportunities in new spaces. Um, I've got a friend of mine as well who runs a, ran a very successful property management company with rentals and things, and he's lost 90% of his business. And I have never come across a man under so much peace. He sold his cars, he sold his house. Um, him and his wife and his three girls are in such a good space and he said he has never had peace like this before you know so I really pray for that for all of you who may be in the situation you know um, so um, yeah so I think in this space you know really trusting the Lord and we're going to go into a time of prayer um, just now and just really praying uh, for you if you're in these circumstances and really trusting the Lord to show you what's in your hand. What can you do with this? What can he make of this? Um, okay. Um, and then I don't think I've covered the teenagers question very well. Um, so I haven't quite solved this one in our family as yet. Um, so I do think what is a very useful thing to start doing and um, a colleague of mine started to do this from when her daughters went to high school is they sat together at the beginning of every year and budgeted and she you know as they got older she made the process a little bit more rigorous um, but she budgeted with them and worked out on a monthly basis with them with quite a lot of support in the beginning um, you know what will you need on a monthly or weekly basis I think when they're a bit younger you need to do a bit more often um, and work out, you know, what do we spend on clothes for you, toothbrushes, uh, you know, 
all sorts of things and you can decide toiletries you can decide what goes in it and her goal was to transition her girls from sort of being dependent on her not really understanding how the money worked to by the time they were 18 19 20 their budget at the beginning of the year was everything that they would spend so if they missed something from the budget that was too bad and she could decide how strict or otherwise she was on implementing that but her whole goal was over those sort of seven 10 years, depending on when you start, is to create that moving of responsibility more and more to them to get this budget right in a safe space. I mean, they were still going to eat, they were going to be housed, all the rest of it. Um, and you help them with the process to make sure they don't forget the big stuff. Um, so she didn't really give them pocket money for spending so much as she gave them this responsibility of budgeting, which she then would do with them. And then she would give that money to them on a weekly basis for them to manage or a monthly basis as they got older. So I found that to be quite a nice model. So that's quite different. Um, and that, that then means that depending on your finances and whatever the amount is different and depending on how you do that process. Um, but I really liked that. And you know, it's something that we want to start with our kids now as well. I really like that idea of including them in the process and helping them with time take responsibility for managing their finances so that at the time when they actually have to do it by themselves, you know, and they add in things like housing and insurance and all the rest that they've actually done it before. Okay. Okay. Um, so just have a look there. I'm just, you can have a look and take those apps down. I'm not an expert. I've seen a couple of them. 20 to 7 is a really good app. Um, so just maybe have a look and take it. Those are four apps there. Um, that uh, a couple of our South African financial experts um, have recommended. And again, it's a very personal thing whether you tech savvy, some of these integrate, so most of them actually integrate all your expenses into your bank accounts and other things. So maybe if you want to just write down what those apps are and you can play with them a little bit and see what works for you. So the My Financial, financial Life one is a net bank one that's accessible to anybody and anybody can actually just um, just go and use it. And again, if you don't want to do a fancy app and you just want to do a calculation every now and again, you're welcome to ask me for a spreadsheet or the bank website. As I say, all of them have got brilliant tools. Okay. Um, yeah, Timba, I think. So the sectional title, full title question uh, that I've been asked is a little bit, I've been asked about the difference between sectional title and full title. That's a little bit above my pay grade. So I think maybe the advice there is to get some advice, sorry. Hello, Timber, I see you. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Coral, this has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, everybody, let's give Coral a hand. So thank you, an emoji thank you, uh, <laughs> thank you Carl, that was um, really awesome. very informative, um, very helpful and very compassionate. 